Order. It is time for questions to the Minister for the Environment, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Ms. Pam Brown. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. My department's recently published waste management strategy includes higher targets for the recovery and recycling of packaging waste and highlights the contribution of voluntary agreements and the incorporation of eco-design in delivering resource efficiency. New recycling targets for the different packaging waste streams were introduced in January this year. Meeting these targets will equate to an overall packaging recycling rate of 72.7% by 2017, significantly above the minimum recycling target set out in the EU Packaging Directive. The court old commitment is a voluntary agreement between government and the retail, grocery and manufacturing sectors managed by the Waste and Resources Action Programme aimed at improving resource efficiency and reducing the carbon and wider environmental impact through increased prevention of food and packaging waste. The second phase of the commitment, which ran from 2010 to 2012, has resulted in a 10 per cent reduction in the carbon impact of grocery packaging. Traditional grocery product and packaging waste in the supply, supply chain was reduced by 7.4 per cent. The third phase of the commitment, which commenced in May 2013, will run until 2015, places further emphasis on the reduction of weight and carbon impact of grocery product and packaging waste. Thomas Brown for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, we're all aware, certainly the females among, amongst us will be very aware, of the waste uh, that comes straight off your, your grocery shop. Um, straight into the various bins as soon as we get home. And there's, uh, there's certainly merit in the argument for multi-trip packaging and product reformulation. Therefore, can the Minister outline when he'll be in a position to issue guidance to um, supply chains regarding the increased use of refillable bags or to make better volumetric use of packaging? Um, uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And thank, uh, Ms Brown, the Deputy Chair of the Committee, for her supplementary question. This is indeed an issue of, of great importance, and it's one that we all within this House have a role in addressing, I think particularly as we move into Christmas, in a time where there is a lot more waste than any other, be it through packaging, wrapping, gift bags. And I think I'd like to take this opportunity to put the message out there to people to minimise on such unnecessary waste packaging at this time. I have recently published the Waste uh, Management Strategy for Northern Ireland, as I have said, delivering resource efficiency, and that aims to set the direction towards using waste as a resource more efficiently and to make it a key element in developing a low-carbon circular economy. Through the Rethink Waste programme, my department provides a range of guidance and incentives indeed to promote waste prevention, including reuse and increased levels of recycling. These include the provision of financial assistance, technical advice, communications and educational resources across the full range of stakeholders, from the individual to community groups to schools and, most importantly, to business. Over £10 million has been allocated to over 100 projects from the Rethink Waste Funds in the last four years for initiatives which boost waste prevention and recycling. I neglected to tell members that questions 8 and 13 have been withdrawn. I will now call Mr Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answers to date. But could I ask him what discussions he's had with the large retailers in relation to this matter, and what cooperation have they been given to the department to try and address these issues? Gormila. Thank the member for the question, uh, which I'll do my best to answer. There has been quite a lot of work done with retailers, both small and large, by my department, primarily through RAP 
an organisation or association with which I'm sure the member, as his party's environment spokesperson, is familiar. As recently as Friday, in fact, I met personally with Sainsbury's in my uh, local dairy store and spoke to them about the importance of this very issue, not just in terms of packaging waste, but also food waste. I am aware of the work done by other large retail chains in this regard, and I think it is something that they are keen to tell me as Minister, to tell departmental officials, to tell the public and indeed to tell other businesses that these, they see real benefits of reducing waste. They see obviously the environmental benefits that we all want to see, but they can see the benefit to their business as well, not just in terms of cost reduction, but also in terms of PR and uh, the, the fact that they can point to this corporate responsibility and show that the greener they are, maybe the better business they'll do as well. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answers. Uh, recyclability is a very, very important issue, and um, one element of that is the reuse of carrier bags. And I would ask the Minister for his assessment of the impact of the carrier bag levy on promoting the reuse of carrier bags. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. McGuinness for his question. The five pence single use carrier bag levy has dramatically reduced the number of single use carrier bags being dispensed since its introduction in April this year. Two recent surveys, one conducted in June and more recently in October, suggest that around half of shoppers are now frequently reusing their carrier bags. While this is extremely encouraging, there is still clearly a lot of room for improvement. I believe that by applying a five pence levy to low cost reusable bags should help significantly reduce unnecessary purchases of these bags, encourage even higher levels of reuse and generate even more substantial environmental benefit. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley for a question. I got cash over the door. I'll ask you to call you. Question number two, please. This issue was recently brought to my attention, and I instructed the Driver and Vehicle Agency to undertake a review of the process to affiliate drivers and vehicles on a taxi operator license. The review has now been completed. And I am pleased to be able to advise that an amended, improved process has been agreed and will be implemented within the next couple of weeks. The new process will significantly reduce the turnaround times for affiliating taxi drivers and vehicles to taxi operator licences. Provided the administration fee of £5 for each additional driver or vehicle added to the licences paid, vehicles and drivers will be added immediately to operator licences. This will mean that the driver and vehicle agency will affiliate drivers and vehicles to operator licences within a target of three working days. Call Mr. Bradley for supplementary. Gromaya got the last one for you. And just a question: Are a yevnu kenur a hockey the cosbori at a dealer license and willing to show got happy kenur a jockey should have been August Ken Kenyal monitorachta a yan harahu. Um, can the Minister confirm when this new turnaround target comes into effect and what level of monitoring there will be? Mobuyas, Asin Kesh, Samuel Shin, Chucky Shid is Jack, a gun, couple of I thank uh, the member for that interesting question and that these new procedures will come in by mid December, I would hope. I have instructed that the new procedures for affiliating the taxi drivers and taxi vehicles to operator licences should be implemented by mid-December, and the DVA will carry out checks on a weekly basis to ensure the new process is working satisfactorily. I have asked for a report on this by the end of March on the operation of procedures to ensure that it is working as intended and the drivers and operators are seeing the benefits of this initiative.
Call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, as the operator licence scheme will be part of the wider considerations on part of the wider reform in terms of taxi regulations, what consideration has he given to the unique situation of Belfast City Centre, and does he intend to make um, any changes or variations in relation to that? Thank uh, Mr. Weir for that supplementary question. I am aware <laughs> of the lobbying going on, in particular around the move to single-tier licensing in Belfast and the fears that, of the implications that might have for the industry, particularly in Belfast, and especially for public hire in Belfast. They have been lobbying not just Mr Weir, but parties right across this chamber on this issue, and I have to say I have a degree of sympathy with their fears. However, I am doing my utmost to allay them. The demand for the services of, of Belfast public hire, or indeed any taxi firm, will be determined by the service being provided and the price at which it is provided. Consumers will and should be able to exercise choice and this is a matter for each consumer. It is for my department as a regulator to set minimum standards which all operators, vehicles and drivers must meet so the taxi users can receive the service they expect and then ensure compliance with those standards. This is what I have relayed again and again to representatives of Belfast Public Hire. I have also undertaken to work with my counterpart, the Minister for regional development around issues such as taxi ranks and perhaps access to bus lanes for wheelchair accessible vehicles. Currently, all Belfast public hire vehicles are wheelchair accessible, so it would be fair to assume that they will still use ranks, they will still use the bus lanes, and uh, I know they are looking for some sort of guarantee that that might be for them alone. I am keen not to alienate anyone Minister, in this process, be it any driver, any company, and will be ha happy to work with Mr Weir and other members of the committee to ensure that this is done right. Call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Some Belfast public hire members have said to me that it won't be financially viable for them to purchase or maintain uh, taxis with disability access comes uh, single tier um, and therefore there will be a reduction in uh, disabled taxis uh, for the public. Can the minister um, explain to us what measures he's taking to try uh, you know, for, for this not to, to happen, to be able to provide the current level of taxis with disability access? I'd like to uh, thank the Chair of the Environment Committee for her question. This is certainly not what we envisage happening, and it's certainly not what we intend to happen. Having met with consumer groups with disability action and other representatives of consumers with disabilities, it's not what they see happening either. On the contrary, what I have heard from representatives in the taxi industry is that there may be a rush to purchase uh, disabled access uh, taxis, thus rendering any advantage that one sector currently does have obsolete. Uh, this is about improving standards. It's about improving accessibility. It's about improving the service and the industry for consumers, but also for drivers, also for operators. And as I had said in an earlier answer, it will be really the market that, that directs this. If drivers see that there is an advantage to them having a disability accessible car, I have no doubt that, that they will pursue that avenue. As regards other cost implications of the implementation of the Taxis Act, we the committee, at the behest of the committee, the introduction of this Act was put back from September this year until September next year. I have looked further at this to enable drivers and operators to prepare for the implementation, and I'm going to stagger 
the, the introduction of measures as part of this act. For example, a printer, a receipt printer, will not now be necessary until 2016. We have looked at the costs and it is calculated that the cost to individual drivers over five years will be somewhere in the region of £840. Delivering the right ICT option to support local government reform is paramount. The Systems Convergence Working Group, set up by my predecessor under the reform structures, has engaged Gartner Advisory Services to review the ICT requirements for local government. The purpose of this was to plan in advance of April 2015 for the transition from 26 to 11 new councils and to determine the best strategic delivery model for local government ICT services thereafter. Gartner has engaged with local government stakeholders to establish key systems convergence priorities, options for the creation of a strategic delivery model and resource plans to deliver key pieces of work for local ICT services. Initial findings show that local government believes that this is a new, more agile, adaptive and flexible ICT delivery model is required to deliver the types of local government services that citizens require, particularly given the challenging fiscal environment. It has been agreed that a hybrid model best aligns with the anticipated working practices of the consolidated councils. In order to deliver the Gartner report's recommendations, it is proposed that a project team is set up to work closely with representatives from each of the 11 STCs in the run-up to April 2015. A consultation on this proposal is underway across local government, and the outcome from this exercise should be available in mid-December. The project team will work to create an IT strategy and a more detailed operating model, but for now, four main types of ICT models are proposed. Firstly, to develop a local government-wide telephony solution that will result in reduced costs and ease of connectivity between all of local government. Secondly, to create a local government <coughs> active directory that will provide for regional identity and access management, as well as the opportunity to deliver secure common business platforms. And thirdly, to form a regional data centre which will There's result in reduced hardware time. costs, a reduced requirement for servers, storage, business continuity and disaster recovery. <laughs> Call Ms. Rand for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer to now. Um, how does the Minister envisage councils meeting the financial implications of the ICT uh, systems convergences? Earlier this year, in February this year, the Executive kindly agreed to proposals from my predecessor for a financial package around the reform of local government. This totaled £47 million, £30 million of which will deal with rates convergence and the rest are for other aspects of reform, including systems convergence that we are talking about now. However, as it is anticipated, indeed expected, that local councils, local government will yield the benefits of huge savings in the future through reform, that councils should now also face some of the cost of reform. Work is ongoing currently on a voluntary basis between many councils through the ICE programme. They have seen benefits through this and I would like to explore the possibility of making this non-optional, non-voluntary, in order to get more councils on board, they will see the benefits. And it's not just about making financial savings, it's also about improving the delivery of services to ratepayers and citizens. Call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. Minister, can you um, tell us when local councils will be given accurate and final figures with respect to the implementation of an ICT programme specifically for the planning service? I'm uh, going to have to come back to you with a precise, or come back to the member with a precise date or anticipated date for that. However, I know it is an issue of huge concern to local councils and to existing statutory transition committees, of whom I have met three over the past two weeks and intend to meet with a further three this week. 
The transfer of planning is perhaps the issue that has had most questions asked about it during my meetings with the STCs. People are worried not only about the cost associated with delivering planning, but also with the training that will be required for members and by members of councils in order to deal with and make planning decisions. So I am keen that we get a planning service that is fit for purpose and that is easy to transfer to local councils. Call Mr Basil McCray. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Has the Minister considered open source coding and platforms uh, as a way of reducing the cost of licences and improving services in the forthcoming uh, changes? I thank the member for that question. I have not to date considered that. I must check with my officials if they have, and if they haven't, I'm sure we now will. Thank you. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? Can I ask him what level of savings are expected uh, as part of this convergence work? A calculation has been done by ICE that over 25 years from reform, there will be savings realised in the region of £200. Obviously, there is outlay at the start. I spoke of the £47 million that will be coming directly from the executive to assist with reform. We definitely need to see, though, at this stage, at this advanced stage, more buy-in from councils and more cooperation from councils, not necessarily cooperation with the department, but cooperation with each other. I spoke there of the ICE programme and the fact that, due to its voluntary nature, <coughs> not as many councils have signed up or participated as we would have liked. In fact, you could describe the speed of ICE as glacial. However, I think now that people do realise that we have come so far and are so close to uh, local government reform, that we will see more action from councils, many of whom, and indeed all of the elected representatives that I've met, are determined to see this cross the line in a way that will deliver better service to citizens and will do so at a fair price. Call Ms Joanne Dobson for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number four. In my statement to the Assembly on the 22nd of October, I clearly set out the legal, procedural and evidential reasons for my decision not to move the planning bill to further consideration stage, including the fact that the Department's legal opinion from David Elvin QC and Paul McLaughlin BL indicated that clauses 4 and 15 were outside the legislative competence of this Assembly. Subsequent to my statement, there was opposition to my decision not to move the bill from some quarters in this Assembly, notably from those who tabled the two significant amendments. Otherwise, I have been heartened by the widespread support that I have received from many quarters both within and outside this chamber in relation to the difficult but necessary decision that I took, which was in the best interests of the planning system and everyone in the North. I stand over that decision. Since my decision, I obtained further supplementary legal opinion from David Elvin QC and Paul McLaughlin BL, which reaffirms their initial opinion. I have shared this opinion with executive colleagues and the Attorney General and invited them to carefully and diligently consider this advice. I have yet to receive any formal or direct comment which opposes the veracity of this opinion. I can advise that I was approached to meet and have now met with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to explore their views on my decision not to move the bill. The meeting was a useful and positive engagement and raised a number of issues which I now wish to carefully and diligently consider. This is the responsible thing to do, and I anticipate further discussions in the near future. In the meantime, I remain committed to pressing ahead with speeding up and improving the planning system to provide the certainty investors and others need to ensure that planning plays its full role in supporting economic recovery and sustainable development. Call Ms Dobson for a supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. But can I ask him, will he take any further action to clarify the seemingly significant contradiction between the legal advice of one of our country's top planning and public law QCs, as provided to the First and Deputy First Minister by the Attorney General? The legal advice, or as a minister, I have the right to seek and receive advice legal advice from whatever source I deem appropriate and have chosen to do so from David Elvin QC, an eminent barrister in this field. It's widely recognised as one of the top barristers <coughs> in planning and public law on these islands and I stand by his advice. Other ministers have the right to seek advice from where they want and I have <coughs> received, subsequent to my announcement, uh, advice from the Attorney General that uh, he disagreed with the initial opinion that I had sought. However, upon seeking a second opinion from the same source and sharing it with the Attorney General and with my executive colleagues, I have not had anyone question the veracity of that legal opinion. Call Mr. Gregory Camp. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I commend the, the Minister? Not long after he took office, I went to him on a planning issue that affected a number of jobs in the North West, and he took direct action. And as a result of that, those jobs were safeguarded. On that very basis, Minister, could I ask you, given the complicated planning processes that we have, that on some occasions mean planning processes taking years, not months, what is he going to do to introduce a much more streamlined, effective delivery mechanism that people can see there is a point in a planning application, particularly if many jobs are at risk? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. Campbell for his thanks for working on that particular issue in your constituency, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I am uh, determined, as I have said, to ensure that we have a planning system that is fast, fair and fit for purpose. And I do indeed have quite a few ideas of how to do this, some of which I shared with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister during our meeting two weeks ago. I have come back from that meeting. They have given me a bit of time to work up these proposals, which I hope to present to them and indeed to the Assembly in the near future. I think it's of vital importance that we have a planning system that gives certainty, as I've said, certainty to investors and certainty to others, and that's what I fully intend to bring about. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. Could the Minister share with us the, the actual feedback that he has received from the business and environmental communities and the general public in relation to his decision not to proceed with the planning bill? I will happily <laughs> share, uh, well, not the feedback, but certainly the gist of it with the member and with the House. Since my decision not to proceed with the planning bill, which I termed as having been made toxic by the significant amendments that were tabled <coughs> at consideration stage, I have received very positive feedback wherever I have gone, be it through meeting with environmental groups or be it from meeting with businesses or representatives of the business community here in the North. They, are, uh, they too want to see a planning system that is fast, a planning system that gives certainty, and want to play their part in ensuring that we have one. All of them, and I emphasize that, everyone I have spoken to since my decision has been of the opinion that the planning bill as amended was not the way to do this. Or do that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Ms. Boyle. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Three Rivers project in Straban? Call the Minister. Thank you for that uh, question, Ms. Boyle. It's not the first time <laughs> today I've been asked for an update on the, the Three Rivers project. Barely a day goes past that I'm not asked for an update on the Three Rivers proposal. 
such as the fervour in Straban and the surrounding area, and such as the desire in that area to see this proposal come to fruition. I am currently assessing the application. I am, as I've said, aware of demand in the area. I took time two months ago maybe to walk around Straban, where I spoke to shoppers and shopkeepers and was struck by the overwhelming support for this proposal. It wasn't unanimous, but it was overwhelming. I hope to be in a position to make a decision on this application in the not so distant future. However, there are some technical issues around the application that would need to be addressed. Call Ms. Boyle for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response and given the high importance of this economic um, development within Straban, can I further ask the Minister what efforts he has made in terms of trying to resolve the outstanding uh, planning issues? Well, uh, there are several outstanding planning issues and without wanting to get into the detail of each and every individual planning issue on each and every planning application in this chamber. I will happily meet with the member and, and, and discuss the, the application which we are currently discussing. Call Ms. Rosalie McCarley for a topical question. Um, Mar Soldanara will may he and Lesh Agus Paul Maske Rim Shakdan with him Agus Flamewood and Eardis Planala for him Slave Give Agus the mix men in the Glashanara says on that at Horchershin as the minister knows myself and Paul Maske met with him a couple of weeks ago and we discussed the uh, issue of the planned application uh, in relation to Black Mountain. Can, can you give us an update on that uh, little? Uh, Gurma, I'll get for you in case. I uh, did indeed meet with the member and the MP for West Belfast on this issue at Black Mountain. And indeed, I'm sympathetic to the concerns raised at that meeting. At that stage, I was awaiting further consultation response from NIEA, or sorry, the National Trust, which I do not believe the department has received yet. I will pursue this. And if it is in, I'll get back to the member. And if it's not, I will chase it to see where it is. Call Ms. McCarley for supplement. Can the minister um, um, assure me that the the concerns of the local residents have been taken into account. Uh, in every application, planning application, the application is subject to full scrutiny and indeed the opinions and concerns of objectors are taken very seriously and taken into account. On this particular application, I am aware acutely of those concerns and indeed that they centre around health fears and so forth, as well as potential damage to an area of outstanding natural beauty that is now being <coughs> much used by hill walkers, motor or sorry, mountain bikers, etc. So I yes can assure the member that those concerns have been taken on board, will be taken account when a final decision is being made. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the cross cutting nature of road safety issues between both the Minister's Department and the Minister for Justice, has he, any, has he had any recent discussions with the Minister for Justice on the issue of speed detection vans and their use? I thank uh, Mr. Campbell for his question. I did indeed meet recently with the Minister for Justice. A lot of our work is cross-cutting, not least that on road safety. However, this very issue, that of speed detection vans, is not something that came up during that meeting. I will happily go back to the Minister of Justice and uh, have another meeting with that on the table. It's vitally important that all departments work together 
in order to reduce the likelihood and incidence of road accidents. And I am determined in this role to ensure full cooperation and collaboration with others to drive down the number of driving-related deaths and accidents on, this ro on our roads. Well, Mr Campbell for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, when he has discussions with the, the, the Minister for Justice uh, on the, the issue of road safety, would he ensure that the discussions about the use of speed detection vans uh, concentrate on the area of road safety and accident prevention? Because many people believe that it's more a case of revenue raising, given where they see the repeated placing of speed detection vans in areas where there have been no accidents whatsoever and that, that purely appears to be a revenue raising exercise. This is certainly an issue I will raise with the Minister, <laughs> yes, who has now joined us, and maybe you can raise it with him before I can. Uh, I am aware of that perception, public perception out there, that these speed traps are there to boost revenue rather than reduce accidents. And I'm aware of a few spots within my own constituency, one not very far from the member's house, that is a uh, Particularly, <laughs> particularly profitable, one might say. I am determined that resources should be allocated where they are needed in order to reduce accidents, not to boost the coffers. Call Mr. Sean Lynch, please. Can the Minister assure us that the name Glens will not be removed from any business marketing or promotional work within the new council cluster of Causeway? Coast and Glens. Sorry, could the member repeat the question? At all? Yeah. Can the minister assure us that the name Glens will not be removed from any business marketing or promotional work within the new council cluster of the Causeway Coast and Glens? That uh, really will, in my opinion, be a matter for the new council to, to decide. However, in terms of boosting tourism, one would imagine that the council would like to have everything in the title that will increase the number of tourists coming into the area. And while the causeway, of course, is widely recognised, one cannot understate the value to tourism of the Glens. Well, Mr. Lynch for supplementary. Um, go on, Greg, uh, I uh, want to thank the Minister for his answers, and he has answered my um, supplementary by agreeing that the removal of the Glens from the new council would be detrimental. So, go on, my Don't don't mention it, but I would think if I can see that the removal of the Glens from the naming of initiatives in that council area could be detrimental to uh, tourism. One would only imagine that locally elected representatives and those charged with making these decisions will be all too aware of it also. Call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Gerda Margot, last can call you. Um, I wonder could, could the Minister outline the, um, how he is assisting the community and voluntary sector to participate fully in the community planning process? I spoke earlier uh, during oral questions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of the training that will be provided as part of local government reform. Well, <laughs> A lot of emphasis of this training will naturally be di directed towards local government, locally elected representatives. There will also be training for the community and voluntary sector in and around the area of community planning. Community planning is a very exciting and very important part of RPA, and we need the full buy-in of communities, not just the community and voluntary sector, of communities to ensure that it works. Therefore, local councils and STCs will be charged with delivering training on a local basis. It's very important that for community planning to succeed, 
that it takes a bottom-up approach. In my opinion, of course, we need departments, ministers signed up and, and, and buying in to it. But for it to really succeed on the ground, we need ordinary people whose lives will be affected by it taking a full role. Call Ms. Rehan for a supplement. Um, and I wonder, would, could the Minister outline what, if he has had discussions with DSD Minister in relation to community and voluntary sector participation, and if so, what they entailed? I am aware of that while uh, my department is charged with local government reform, other departments will be transferring functions, and the Department of Social Development will be transferring the function of community development. The model to which they are transferring is different from that of my own department. Currently, I know they are transferring the budget associated with community development without transferring the staff. However, it will be up to the new councils who are taking or having these powers and functions transferred to them. They will be given the option of indeed taking on the staff from DSD who are currently performing this function on a secondment basis. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley for topic. Um, could I ask the Minister for an update on the status of the Road Traffic Amendment Bill, which aims to reduce deaths and injuries on our roads? Uh, and I will happily provide an update to the, the status of the, or on the status of this bill, which is an important and will play an important role in driving down carnage on our roads. The principal objective of the bill is to reduce fatal and serious injury collisions where driver or rider alcohol is a causation factor, and also to address the over-representation of young drivers in fatal and serious collisions on our road. A comprehensive consultation process was carried out in the development of the policies the drink driving consultation in 2009, the graduated driver licensing policy consultation in 2011, and the drink driving legislation consultation just last year. The original version of the paper was issued to the executive on the 15th of May this year. I understand there are competing priorities within the executive, but I hope to be in a position to introduce this important bill early in the next year. Call Mr Bradley for a supplementary. Um, can the Minister tell us um, what impact he believes this bill will have on the current statistics? As I have said, one of the key aims of this bill is to tackle the over-representation of young drivers in a our fatal and serious road collision statistics and believe that the graduated driver licensing programme that I referred to in my earlier answer plays a key role and will play a key role in this if statistics elsewhere across the globe are to be believed. This is a very important issue. I believe it will succeed in addressing road uh, accidents. It will succeed in reducing road accidents and therefore should be widely welcomed across this house. Order. Time is up. We must move on to questions to the Minister of Justice.